Hello listeners and welcome to another episode of Quote and Quote with KK. I would love to now talk about the 5G era in India. Next week our prime minister will be inaugurating 5G in our country. And obviously there will be the providers of 5G which is Airtel, Jio and Vodafone and many others who have bidded for 5G who would also be making headline statements about what this 5G revolution will be doing to this country however a large part of our country is still not having access to the basic mobile telephony even with 2g or maybe 3g or 4g as well and therefore i would love to talk about in our today's podcast 5g and how can social tech ventures deliver better impact and happiness to rural india you see many of our podcasts discussed on happiness at a broad level and maybe also urban centric and therefore in today's podcast we would like to shift the focus to the rural india and how happiness can be delivered to the rural heartland of india at the cusp of launching 5g and the technologies which will bring revolution and change the lives of people in india let me also talk about the issues on the ground in the past and during the pandemic the government and social ventures had launched several initiatives using technology to reach the mass initiatives like aadhar vaccine portal direct benefit transfer financial inclusion schemes are many such initiatives obviously a large part of those are running or being accessed by the rural folks through their mobile phone and by my own personal experience on such initiatives i have had a very negative experience and i keep wondering if there is some sort of ponzi activity be- running behind it or working behind it. let you give you an example of what i am saying when i went to register my own aadhar using my own mobile number i was given to understand that there are several aadhar cards already registered on my own personal mobile number from very remote parts of india i did not even know that this was going on and my mobile number was already in the aadhar database with no prior intimation to me i had to call the uidai chairman nandan nilakani the then cto and ceo of uidai technology center dr pramod verma to sort out the fraud or dubious ways where people in different parts of india including rural india were impersonating using my mobile number long short is short i was finally able to get my aadhar number on my mobile number and the other other numbers were subsequently deregistered from my mobile number. once again my mobile number was used by several people to register for their vaccine although i was eligible for vaccine under the healthcare worker i had to go into queue and get the vaccine months later when the government opened up the private healthcare providers to vaccinate people such has been my unhappiness now can you wonder that i get on my mobile smss for lpg gas subsidy bank accounts and the list goes on now how would this be happening in the rural context with somebody who is trying to get services using their mobile phone from various different agencies and i'm sure many such rural folks who are naive would have been victim to such frauds and impersonation by other people and hence to get things done you have to connect to people at higher places and escalate to sort out these issues and get the system cleaned up the same is true with the private sector and psus who are getting their system hacked be it electricity connection bills gas bills and millions of people like me and millions who are deprived because there is a bug in that technology that drive this to a whole lot of unhappiness across country and particularly the rural masses who are so technology naive in the past i have been part of several ict development initiatives not just in india but in africa as well while the intent and vision of these have been positive and onerous the actual execution on the ground of the technology sometimes have been a hit and miss so how can we create a much more engaging inclusive technology platform that can deliver impact and happiness to the masses to talk all this i have invited dr aditeshwar seth who is a co-founder at gramvani and also professor at iit delhi let me discuss a little bit more about adi I had come in touch with Adi since 2010 when I visited him and I was a senior executive at Cisco that was driving the 108 and 104 health initiatives in this country. In 2013 when I wrote a article 
creating a socially and inclusive social media in healthcare in India, I had profiled Gramwani in my article. The article was so powerful that in 2017, when I was visiting New York and the Facebook office at Broadway in New York, I happened to meet the chief marketing officer who was working out of that office. It was a half an hour unscheduled discussion with her and the critical issue that we discussed was how could Facebook be more inclusive? They did not even have an idea about the reach and access of a social media platform to the rural masses. And I thank Adi for providing me the real issues and inspiration for the thought leadership and even the folks of Facebook who really appreciated my point of view in that article. More about Adi, he has written books and his recent book we are going to talk about in our podcast as well, which is on technology. Adi has done his PhD under Professor S. Keshav and Professor R. Cohen from the University of Waterloo. He has been associated in the technology side of things ever since. And in 2019, he and his students released a website to monitor the biases in policy making, the giant economy monitor, bringing together much of his learnings that he has gained over the last decade and a half. He has written a book, Technology and Disempowerment, A Call to Technologists, which he recently published. It's a seminal work in countries like India and a call to action for various social entrepreneurs and technologists who struggle to build the right tech for the common base for the rural mass and i would love to talk about so welcome to our podcast quote unquote with kk adi it's pleasure you here let Thank me you. first start with the inspiration on the discussion on gramwani which really impressed and can you tell me about gramwani how does it work what was your motivation and inspiration to start it and can you talk about your journey and lessons learned to gramwani yeah thanks kk thanks so much for having me and yeah so diving straight in so actually the inspiration for gramwani really came seeing how social media was really revolutionizing and democratizing communication it was giving the power of in the hands of the people to talk about their issue, hold governments accountable, stakeholders accountable. And this is sort of, I'm talking 2009, before the time the media got its bad name. But yeah, and the problem however was that it was only acts the literate population, the internet connected population, and we that have been similar for uh, rural areas where lit- there are literacy challenges and internet and, and so many other issues. So, so this was really the inspiration and uh, one of the key things that we zeroed down on was voice as a medium of communication because this becomes like a lowest common denominator that's accessible to anybody. And then since then, we've been building, uh, we've worked on several different platforms. When we started Gramwani, we worked on community radio, which is basically a very participatory medium that local communities to create their own content in order to share it locally. And everything being local, it means that information is very contextual, can understand it easily. And uh, people also understand the local power dynamics. So they are the best judge of what to say, what not to say, how to strategize around making sure the panchayats are more equitable the local governments are held more account. so 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 we did that the radio and then after a couple of years we uh, started offering this ivr interactive voice just because one of the issues that community radio was faced that it can only broadcast in a given radius and therefore it's only accessible to that particular community but uh, we we, knew, we we could see that because of migration people move out but still they want to remain connected with their home and native place and community radio also likes so that's when using interactive voices and uh, uh, this was great because people could people uh, the way the system works you can call they can listen to audio messages and they can record their own messages which is the key part and then these messages that they record can be heard by other people so it's very useful to start discussions in communities on social issues on government schemes on policies even like co- local events youth events kabaddi matches cricket matches just about anything so so yeah so those were those were really the things that we wanted to do and using voice has been validated very nicely now we are also offering the same service WhatsApp and over an Android app that as people migrate to smart, they're still able to similar services. And uh, and yeah, I mean, the lessons learned have been tremendous. Partly we've seen the communities be very, very imaginative in the use cases that they evolved out of using these systems. So right, using them for question answering in agriculture where somebody asks a question, other people in the community help answer these questions. Similarly, question health, accountability issues on government schemes and grievance redressal. These have been some of relevant use cases but one of the biggest lessons which i think is what i've sort of reflected upon deeply in my book
is really the limit you can expect from technology alone because very honestly when we started ramani we were just a team of five techies i myself i i teach here in the computer department at iit delhi and we had a very very naive notion that we know how to build technology we'll build it and it will change the world but actually when we started working on the ground that's when we realized that building the tech was the easiest part the harder part was actually getting people to understand how to use it think about why it is useful and then give feedback about problems that were arising as they were using it and not just like technical problems but actual social problems and how we should evolve policies around this so all the stuff that we are we see social media dealing with today on content moderation and so on all of this is what so experience build policies very different methods actually you can talk about some of that as you go along totally so yeah so i mean the ex was very very rich and it really was humbling for us to understand that just thinking about it from a technocratic lens is very very limiting we really need a much broader perspective to make sure that the techies are don't don't create harm but they they use responsibly and how to scaffold the technology so that it serves actually impacts so those have been really some interesting key less soldier in fact adi i would echo the same even for for profit ventures india guys from iit and all these engineering colleges know how to build the tech but the business model and ground pack of how the to run on the technology they still struggle and then people like us have enter and work with them to solidify the business model behind it so what you have echoed i guess is the same naivety with a lot of the technocrats and the techies start a venture with a very grandiose vision but still struggle to you know get the success and the impact on the ground correct correct exact completely i wanted to understand when you started it was just voice and obviously technology and tech has also evolved you have now got podcast another kind of voice medium which i am doing and you are participating is also a form of a medium of creating content and disseminating it then you have also got now people who have started ott platforms and i personally have been the first to experiment ott with voice as one of the first podcasts on z5 as well as a platform so voice as a medium i agree that you you created it and it was a past dissemination one but haven't you ever thought that gramvani could even evolve at a much bigger social content generation mechanism with various other platforms on which you could integrate and disseminate yeah no absolutely so actually uh, kk we are trying to distinguish bit content in terms of essentially cu- curated centrally recorded content and content for engagement so voice is very good for the second where it provides a mechanism for people to engage the act what in turn call it studio generated content so because it's sort of built in a studio and so there it really depends the access capability is the infrastructure right video for example if, if it is easy to create video then that's fine otherwise you can do it on voice if there is good literacy in the community you can even do text but voice sound is very very good for a quick interaction modality with the people so that i think is is sticking with us even uh, even with our app for example and even with our whatsapp channel we regularly also push uh, youtube videos over youtube and uh, any other interesting like infographics or any other info- interesting useful material that we find but we we've seen again and again that for users it's it's easy for them to ask questions or provide some feedback over voice great uh, you started gramvani when it was 2g gen right and now most, now we are they were not even <laughs> correct and now we are going to be embark 5g generation and let me tell you you know even having the smartest of the smartphone when i go on my land which is 70 kilometers here in a very the most backward district of india the palghar district i don't even get to 1g let alone 2g and to run a lot of our technology based platforms and solution at least now the bare minimum is 3g how and what do you think to be telling our telecom and government that to have gramin like models like gramvani many other social ventures and impact models leveraging technology that the connectivity needs to be there that's the bare minimum that can lead creating all these other technology driven impact models where what has been your experience of the connectivity in the rural areas is it still 1g 3g 4g or we are still 
people i don't know where we are no i mean connectivity has improved a lot in fact i mean in at least in all the block headquarters uh, typically that we go there is good 4g connectivity so but still deeper into the rural areas that's where so 3g is not active any and 2g many handsets now don't sort of support it so so now that becomes a problem that earlier there was a basic channel that was available but even that is broken g is sort of the only option but that said i mean connectivity has definitely improved a lot even smartphone ownership although there's a big skew in at, at the household level most of many households do have smart but the access to the device with the male members either or maybe with the young son sort of there's a big digital gender divide so in general i think the more bit connectivity there is definitely it will it will be better and there is a long way to go but we have definitely come a long way as compared to what it was so you think the government and the now even google and facebook have invested in our telecom providers like reliance and airtel is that not going to be invested in creating the rural infrastructure for connectivity or it is just going to be still you know enhancing the 4g 5g 6g and there is going to be a big divide between urban and connectivity and technology yeah i mean so that's aspects i do talk about in my book also that Correct. typically technology when it's done by the market system it tends to amplify inequality. the market will always try to optimize for markets where there is greater disposable income where they can right sell products and they know that if they advertise right you buy so so same is the case with connectivity also and it's always been there that a lot of the investment effort gets skewed towards urban areas or developed areas and rural areas are i mean it's, it's just becomes the gap just widening right it's like a ever receding horizon just keeps getting further and further so but that said come do want to expand to rural markets it's closely connected with the, the state of the economy if, if rural areas speak up then people would want to purchase and buy and everything but definitely the government play so the government does have these funds called the uso funds where which they use for investing and creating rural infrastructure it's not clear how the fund is with 4g for example i think 4g is pretty much being driven by the private sector but but yeah there is a strong role for bringing some kind of mix for greater equity otherwise technologies will keep i think the improving. digital divide will go on expanding further and further as yeah. urban centric population has a much more a greater right. and third connectivity whereas right. rural india lags behind right. and i would love to take your comment on this one recently vodafone india mm-hmm. talked about you know we are enhancing our network and make much more faster so that you can sell more ice cream that's how the guy was telling te- mm-hmm. telling to the ice cream vendor right. now the corollary there a lot what you talked about the trade commerce and social commerce now the more buzzword for the as go deeper into the heartland of india how much is the penetration and how much is this really a real opportunity because people over here in the boardrooms talk about big numbers big numbers big access and everything but you have been on the ground can you elaborate where is the penetration if you even have the basic infrastructure of connectivity yeah yeah no exactly so i mean many things are relevant right so one the connectivity the the other is the, just the state of the economy right that what sort of a social commerce will be enabled in remote pockets right where currently if even the basic needs of people are not being met so i think india has always had very large diversity and the narratives therefore are applicable right it's not that these narratives are not valid but but they are valid in a much smaller pocket maybe they're projected as rural is changing right but that's it is it is valid maybe in like more closer places closer to block centers district centers but it's still nowhere close in terms of much further areas over there we still see basic issues of the road infrastructures being broken electricity availability with climate change we are seeing a lot of problems with access to irrigation facilities rains are erratic and even now so we do a lot of work in areas in bihar and jharkhand and the rains were delayed and it caused a, in the news we we hear in terms of kharif cropping for paddy coming down a couple of percentage points but those couple of percentage points actually mean a lot when it comes right. to the farmers who are producing because they are all actually since if they lose out being able to transplant their saplings in time it the investment is also wasted plus they don't even have the, the food coming in at the right time so yeah so i mean long story short there are india will always have these many many different narratives we will talk in terms of india and bharat but actually even over there there's a very wide spectrum yeah so can i put a number say on 1 out to 10 we may be what 3 out of 10 as far as connectivity is concerned
concern the deepest deepest rural india yeah i i mean i would maybe overall i would say it be something like 5 or 6 out of 10 there is still at least i think the indian population that is lacking access either to connectivity or just in terms of the socio cultural dynamics where like i was mentioning there is there is very gender uh, digital gap which which needs to be bridged so there are and and this is not like i was saying right the connectivity right socio cultural there is also a big element of digital literacy also over here correct and the reason why that is important is not just so that people can use technology but also be aware of where the technology from what should they be concerned about so you correct. you for example spoke about this fraud that often happens with aadhaar right same correct. mobile number correcting multiple cars and correct. right these things are day in day out of with people getting swindled their very hard earned income by phishing scam right somebody calls you say is right you won a lottery right give, correct. give us your otp and this and that even more than that right the sadder part is uh, even like cash transfers which are done by the government through direct benefit from right now in some sense it's great that the money is directly going into people's bank account so there's no middleman and so on but in the reality is banks are actually very far away correct. so people can't travel to the banks and therefore the mechanism and mechanism that's being evolved something called customer service points which are either physical kiosks run by banks or confront or it's actually people who travel to villages with a pass oh. and people do a biometric authentication and they can then get but over there also we have seen countless cases is a fraud where the operators who are running printing machines they get the biometric authentication done and then they tell people that your authentication failed but okay. actually it had succeeded uh-huh. and then the money gets pocketed by them so okay. we have seen this kind of issues and the reason why coming down to this digital literacy thing is that with greater connectivity people are coming online there's this access and there's so many options that open up correct be it for consuming news be it for loan application anything but till the time people are not really They don't, they don't have a grip over what is this tech does it work where does it go wrong what should we be concerned about what are the risks it can lead to a lot of exploitation where those who understood the system they are able to hack they are able to exploit and ultimately it's the the poor who are not so savvy who don't have access to grievance redress procedures they end up losing out so that is yet another thing i think we just talk physical infrastructure of connectivity or like access of device we often miss out on this other very important aspect maybe the tech is just do fast and right. people are not able to understand keep up and, and be yeah. uh, made for dummies or idiots right uh, adi i want to bring it up in terms of the digital divide this is some study that we had done as a fund and an investor on which are the best states to invest in 21 using our algos and doing a whole host of data and one of the key parameters that we used was penetration of digital health across which there were different other parameters sub parameters and what we found in that parameter of digital health because over time and lockdown was due to telemedicine delivery of healthcare across digital health vaccines that were going to come up we find a very big variation even across state on penetration of digital or connectivity and as you rightly said bihar and those states are very very lagging behind and some of the states like the aswal ap and the southern states have a much better connect why is that and what is the reason why the some of the states in spite of 70 plus years have so lagged behind whereas southern states have actually invested or or i have created a, an enabling connectivity and environment for delivery of all these sort of social service on technology and and mobile and internet and whatever i mean i think it's got to do with the economic policies right social and economic policies of the state i mean southern states like especially kerala and tamil nadu have had a much stronger accountability in what solution and that sort of gets reflected there even probably in terms of what the state and demands from the private sector uh, and but maybe in many other states like in, in north india in up bihar all of these the Good. i mean these are Chhattisgarh, some of these yeah. uh, states which are almost 20% of the of the potential of the infrastructure in the southern right. state right. i mean i'm just giving a number it's not to yeah. be taken hard in stone but because yeah. we crunch a whole host of statistics and a lot of data at the media and on a lot of complaints and try and all that other to actually arrive at this heat map across the states yeah. comparing the states yeah yeah no is 
that case. So I think it's a lot to do with the policies and the policies which have also shaped the development state so far. So if the state has been, the bureaucracy sort of has been weak in implementation of welfare, the communities have, because of whatever much longer duration history of feudal systems, the community is not, the social movements are weaker, a community empowerment is lesser for the citizens to demand more accountability. So I think it's, it's really a, a mix of all of these factors, which then, of course, affect development and then further, therefore, consequently, the investments that the private sector feels comfortable in making in these states. Yeah, I mean, so this we see every time, right? With industrialization, anything is the right. same industrial areas which keep getting more and more industries. So if you look at the industrialized industrialization heat map, right? It's just a couple of islands here and there, everything Correct. aligned. Correct. So, so it's that. There is definitely a big, big role of looking at like resource allocation with equity length. So even things like CSR, for example. So we, we see that even CSR typically gets invested in these areas where companies already have their factories and sort of meant to benefit the community around that. Correct. Even though, right, other areas, right, left even behind. So that fairness, in some sense, needs to be imposed by the state and the state needs to be handled by the state. It's a, it's a vicious circle. Unless the citizens are empowered enough, they will demand enough. Adi, if I were to summarize, for many more Gramwani-like and Gramin-like initiatives and social ventures to come up and be successful in India, we have a wide variation of, first of all, the connectivity. Second, in terms of how deep and how widespread the population is in the nook and cranny of each of the states. The third thing is that to enable all how accessible and how open the community is. And I guess these are a few things that I'm learning from the conversation that I have had. And last, how amenable and how quick the social venture entrepreneur is to pivot and learn on the ground and make the thing much more viable and impact. Is that correct? I think the reality is very complex. Like you said, there are so many of these factors. You you need a model and which can potentially work in ma- many, many diverse conditions. And the problems to solve are also multifaceted. Right. From I mean, it's not just about creating something which is financially sustainable. To Even to get there, you need to drive community adoption. And for community adoption, need, you need to invest also in basic awareness and so that people can consider different options where they can try out. So, so yeah, so I mean, the reality is complex and that's really crux. One of the problems that when happens, talk about technology-driven ventures, is that the promise that it is really sold with, right, is that it will help scale. Whatever you do, it techno- if you bring in technology, it will help scale that. And that, I think, is, is a hard sell because the world is very, very complex. And thinking that this kind of one of the people in this space of ICTs, technologies for development, right, Kentaro Toyama, he calls these packaged in- interventions, right, mm. that, okay, there's a template, there's a package, you just deploy that package and you deploy it everywhere and exchange it. So that, in reality, doesn't work. And right. that is why we all see many risks, many harms also arising from these tech ventures because they've not really considered that complexity. They've sort of just jumped into it very naively. And that is why you need many, many other processes around it. Processes of, right, to shape usage policies, to shape how you respond to community feedback, you spot problems, and, and then you take it seriously to try and fix f- fix your systems so that these problems don't arise. So I think a lot of the, the tech lash, right, a big tech, these like Facebook especially, has been around these lines that have they done enough to address the problems which the plat have in them. And this is really arising, I think, this underlying notion, I mean, a very simplistic model of and not acknowledging the deep complexity that the technology need to cater to. Adi, I want to have, before I call issue around Gram One, social impactful business models, a lot of people, social venture ecosystem talk about impact, impact, ESG, environmental governance, and talk about a lot of this. But as a social venture entrepreneur and having done Gramwani, I'm sure you would have a better idea of what pack parameters are on which a tech venture like yours be measured. People here talk about different, and I think this is pedantic and theoretical rather than practical in terms of what impact it is all about. I would love to hear in terms of how you have gone about defining that social impact and the biggest impact is happiness. And that's the bottom yeah. of our season is health and happiness. Right. So I would love to get from your mouth what went about and how you have defined those impact parameters. Yeah, actually that's a, it's, it, I would say it's a work in progress. It, it, 
I think it will always be work in progress. But right, so the longer answer I think really is that you see technically there are many ways of course measuring impact. When we talk about default development where it's specifically meant to create some development changes over there, there are a plethora of indicators, SDGs, and then all the sub indicators under these SDGs, and there are well established randomized control trials and say experimental different methods and many many such methods right that can help measure. And I think even say the social stock exchange are trying to bring in some of that element so now there are pros and cons on many fronts so i think one it's good to measure because that will help direct the investments which are actually making a change so i think it's good from that the the challenge of course is that the additional investment effort required to do these measurements that may not always be feasible especially when it comes to startups small small enterprises and that can create an uneven playing where established enterprises right maybe they already have done these rcts maybe they have these they will naturally get an upper hand over organizations not done it. The other issue also is that metrics like the SD, they are a good set of metrics, but they are not complete in itself because there are, I mean, there are so many things. So, so when we talk to people in our own community and right, we then try and, right, so there are these qualitative methods like the most significant change method. So what that, the way it works is you get people in discussion and then you go around the circle asking everybody, how has this really changed your life? And it's all recall based stuff. And then the community discusses and finally they come to a consensus and I mean here there are very very different things that we, we hear so when we talk to volunteers that how has this changed you so it's fine yeah some of our volunteers say that it really made us very happy that we were able to see that we were able to give to our community we use mobile money we raised grievances and then grievances got addressed transparency that we brought about and, and it is great but new things come up right that volunteers say that it just made us more confident in public speaking some of our women volunteers say that you give us a very very small stipend which is right, really, really small. But some of them have actually been able to save just this stipend and they were able to use this for education of their daughter. And now, how do you start defining? Now, these kind of impact parameters say that in my model, I will have so many percentage of my volunteers will be able to send their dot pool. I mean, that indicator for it will be very difficult to measure. But and second, won't even be able to anticipate that such a thing is something you would have. Same when it comes to the communities that now many users, for example, tell us that what we gained is about problems that different communities in our village face. We know those people, we know these families, they live in the same hamlet or neighboring hamlet, but we didn't actually know what problems they're actually facing. But now through this platform, we've gotten that awareness and now we were conscious when we sit in Gram Sabha meetings and try and discuss how Narega funds should be used for example. So, so I mean, the thing is that the way technology or anything impacts people, it is a moving target in the sense that it really many, many aspects will emerge over time which you may not have. So that makes it challenging, definitely when it comes to investors or even you know things like social stock exchange and everything that how, how much of agility will they permit or are they sort of imposing a rigidity and that then ultimately means that innovation new thing for new things to emerge and sort of established players established methods that kind of a narrative keeps getting perpetuated and which is also in the development space that has been the narrative for the last 50 years since Correct. when development itself as a concept started being challenged by people like Arturo Escobar that is development is a top down so this is actually track because right. when being imposed top down literally means that right somebody has come and said okay these are the indicators show me an impact on those but why are those the most important indicators are you open to listening from people right what indicators do they want so that's where i agree with this is a issue that we have also discussed with the whole issue of impact and uh, how do you measure and where is the audit mechanism and so on and so forth while we were delivering stock exchange uh, regulation one of the things and you rightly echoed you know when you go bottom up inductive approach rather than a top down deductive up. The data is a challenge and it's it's a challenge on both sides, even top down or bottom up because somewhere you are out on the aggregation and data loss yeah. and be able to make this whole framework much more powerful, much more validated. You need data and mm -hmm. the whole crunch on the data and where the whole way is that data itself is not shared or it's not transparently shared because some vested interests don't want to get it shared, don't want it to come up so that people can understand the issue can come and work on problems and solutions around that i want 
wanted your take because social stock exchange as a platform will only succeed when there are more players on it when there are more donors on it and there is transparency around how you define that impact so i would love to get your take on this then we'd love to move on to another topic actually that point is very valid kapil and i'll example an alternate model agriculture where people for example are talking about a stronger connect with the consumer and the farmer so this the is farm one to fork exam- model and what we are talking right but actually i mean more than farm to fork so farm to fork can be done in many ways that you have right. the farmers are making something you have an intermediary who picks it up you have a consumer gets delivered but that's not creating a cons- farmer connect so right. imagine right if there was something where the consu- the exact farm from which their food is coming they also know the farmer there are some let's say you know i mean social media is everywhere these days right maybe right. there are these social media systems for the consumers to remain connected with the farmers and i mean how about that kind of a system because this will encourage transparency the farmers would want the consumer you know what challenges they're facing and then they become joint risk takers because why should the farmer be the risk taker in this whole setup risk Correct. from weather and and then figure out crop insurance and all sorts of mechanisms why can't the consumers also participate in that risk because actually the way the, the i mean the agri policy is also typically evolves for more for consumer protection rather than for farmer protection right. so, so security if you have, yeah right exactly so but if such kind of maybe these are i don't know what term is possibly used but uh, cooperative uh, but which are joint cooperatives right? not just like farmer cooperatives which is typically one model that but joint cooperatives with farmers and consumers and where the consumers are investing directly or i mean investing in the sense be it as a grant be it as a be it as equity whatever right but that's one you know direct connect with the community that is being impacted so i think that such model can potentially be considered now that the technology and right for making all of these are getting better and better and there are a couple of initiatives which try to do something like this like in india there's there's this initiative called rang de which mm. yeah so they enable retail people to to sort of give loans and grants to micro enterprises and they establish this personal connect so i think in that sense in that case the data could take any form it could be qualitative data it could be photographs right it need not always be like very metricated but i think this can be an alternate model rather than have institutions and through that dis- yeah, again i wanted to go a, a little beyond the regulatory framework here you see cooperative again becomes a different framework outside of whole impact based stock exchange but these days there is something called crowd crowd fund crowd you could say a crowd consumer platform and a crowd supplier or a farmer plat intermediation to these different crowd platform that could be a direct kind of a model of commerce of the future i guess that somewhere the technology also work impact also can be defined the data is also available and the win win for all no yeah i mean i think there are all these are, are good I'm, and i'm not saying the social stock exchange is a bad idea i think it is great but i'm just saying that there are i mean multiple such things which can fill in gaps for each other exactly that can really keep thinking about as adi i wanted to now take another topic your book very sure. inspiring for me i've read it cover to cover and for the benefit of the audience adi written a book on technology and i would love adi spread the message the inspiration behind the book and going to be available i will share the link also on the podcast for you to order it and book the book and read the book as well particularly for people who want to be social venture entrepreneurs as well as people who participate in the technology and technology development in the sector as well as people who want to take up a career in development as well so adi i would love to hear from your mouth it's a great thesis i've never found this so far and i'm really excited to read and uh, talk about it on this podcast no thanks so much kapil for speaking so kindly about this so so yes yeah, so the book is called technology and disempowerment with this in bracket and so that's sort of the main theme that technology of course empowers but it can not power so that's one of the things i've tried to entangle that how should technology be built and managed so that it more empower rather than problems that it creates and the subtitle for the book is a call to technologists which i wanted to aim the book basically towards technologists basically people like me who think that and want to build technology and with the right intention that it pen and therefore what all should we really keep in mind so i talk uh, several things so in terms of how to go there i go into some some depth in terms of so one is some problems in the technology design itself where the, the design itself might be biased towards some agenda 
and what these issues uh, how to be careful about not to have such issues surface and then i say that so so you might be familiar with this whole no, ethics by design these days right. we hear a lot about privacy for example privacy by design is built into the technology so one of the other themes i explore is that just embedding things into the design itself is not sufficient because exactly the things we were talking about that the world is very complex and uh, you will not be able to anticipate all of this complexity to be able to design it such that it's able to you know work in many many diverse surprises will spring up the world is immense flex and not all of it can be built be it for AI be it for other assigned so now how do you manage it in a better way and this is where need to build process so that you're getting regular feedback the users from other stakeholders even indirectly other people that might be influenced by the technology so that you list and you're trying to fix so the ethics for example might be informing the design of the technology the same ethics will need to be demonstrated and created and sticks managed going forward then the other things I explore is the standpoint of technologists that okay now all of this is is, is fine it's it's known i mean i'm not the only one saying these things many other people in better and much better in much better ways than me about design issues management issues and problems that tech, technology creates but then why do we still have problems keep coming up again and again so that's where i go a bit into things like the organizational structure where if the typically the way com- improving technology companies are structured is you have engineers in one department you have designers in another department the business team in the department Department. all of this creates silos and which impedes flow of information so that the engineers also often don't know what to build or what's the right thing to build because it might not be flowing so so there are some of these things the organizational culture about the organizational structure that often impedes what values are actually practiced there are values which might be stated but then there are values which actually are actually being enacted and so some of the gaps uh, arise often from the organization setup the other part which is biggest challenge and there is no easy way around it the other part because of which often ethics is ignored is the political economy in which the technology is being developed and this is where sometimes some technologies might be favored by the state for certain things so for example Soshana Zuboff has written this fantastic book serverless capital where she chalked the growth of google and facebook as happening at around the same time when 9-11 happened and this was because even though the comps were looking into data private private lives of people and and using that for business but the regulations were not coming down heavily the regulatory agents I mean now is the regulatory agents more heavily right? especially in Europe but at that time they were not because they were actually so able to use this information that is collecting so there are these kind of political events which happen when the state might favor certain types of tech for its own reasons and that leads to an erosion what values are followed often otherwise there is also the whole growth mindset where you right so this goes into the impact metrics that we were talking about just now that if you're just trying to maximize like number of users and to optimize your operations for that then you will miss out on many things right Correct. because I mean it might be easier to acquire users who are already tech savvy users who are young men but then you're actually missing out on many other demographic groups and so this again is not in because it requires you to deploy capital for cases where you know you will not get as much of a return and this means that you have to forego but are investors willing to forego I think so things like ESG I mean they have a lot of power they can and investors if they want they can try and build some of these guardrails but will they because I mean there is competition if you uh, right so can ethics really be a business model I don't know I mean in the sense that if somebody wants to invest in a company which will say I will have smaller number of users but more impact and another company which says I don't care about right impacting or cost I just maximize the users where will the investors put in their money right if everybody is putting their money into the second case then naturally I mean it leads to unfair but that is really where the constraints of operating in a very competitive system comes in so uh, so this is the other aspect I so explore and with the idea basically that I sort of right I mean as an engineer I was very naive about all of this I had no clue uh, I've just read and through experiences I've learned some of this so this is something which I would like my students and other technologists sort of to all keep in mind that where are they their end what outcomes is their labor leading to because very often we don't think about it we, we want to work hard we're working hard we think our tech things are having an impact because it's by billions of users and right. But is that stuff? And so this is where the other part, which I call right, a call to technology, is that I say that technologists actually have a lot of power today. Because I mean, you you look at any company, anybody, they all are employee retention of their biggest challenge. And but if technologists sort of say that, well, want are we even in governments, we want a government department more ethical, to be fair, to sort of not just chase metrics and users, but to actually also look at impact metrics. So if technologists do collectivize and they come together, then I think they can change really the variables that the political economy 
many other ways forces to to change and if that can then i think the world can really change i want to take up the point of girl and matters of the world you see the data that is coming out of system is now getting built behind garden so apple meta google even jio kai os running a large part of rural india and then you have your other platforms like the tutor and what have you they are building garden the data and the content actually is of the user billions of users across india but they now are not going beyond their platform what is the future trend here dangerous for such player to influence social and societal behavior through their own tech platforms and that also means that they are creating monopolistic social structures around the leverage of technology will this not lead a very different fragmentation of society around tech users billions of tech users yeah it's a dangerous trend i see yeah but i think there are multiple layers to it also i mean the fundamental is what data is being collected and what is it used so i mean that's what i'm asking whether that data is all card shared in some way but the point is that if this data is being used for exploitation users as consumers right so sort of like the argument that sushana zubov makes in surveillance capital the data is actually to shape consumer behavior to sort of right if you can predict that if you show this ad click on it then i mean you're not just profiting the user clicking on the ad but you're the greater use of the technology is in persuading the user to buy that particular product yeah and, uh, uh, you right. know you take part of the profit right. of the social commerce that is getting generated so you are right. getting richer right. but the consumer and social society at large is not getting richer exactly so i think that's like a more deeper rooted thing that what is this data used and then after that let's say then do finds of the data users right i mean like in health for example let's say pooling of some of this data through privacy preserving mechanisms like right? differential privacy and so on potentially let's say exploitation is not there but this data can be very tracking at these right. predictions uh, then definitely the wall garden kind of a setup is harmful because then the use of the data which can benefit from combining all of this can be yeah, useful for the community good yeah. right exactly so that's there i don't know what the future holds but i mean what what the companies are basically trying to do is the, the winner takes all kind of setup that we will become we, we will basically have the entire community within our system and then we'll everything with it so that's at least what the business is is trying to aim for and i think anti trust kind of regulations coming up in europe i think they are showing the right way forward both prevent this kind of a monopolization as well as the intent behind things like gdpr is is fine right they really talk about you data ownership residing the same right various purpose specification mechanism to use the data the gaps however are all in the implementation are companies really following these regulations right how do you ensure that these actually do that so that's where there are gaps and there's no easy solution as such so so yeah so i mean i i don't know what the future will look like but definitely there need to be greater safety in constraining what the data is used and then yeah some ex for greater cooperation so that data which is for the common is shared and or mechanisms are built for that sharing and exchange and then the data can be straight for better science Let's talk about ethical and all now the flip side of it is a good regulation or a regulatory mechanism i want your point of view in the future whole information communication technology for development how the regulatory environment will shape up and where do you think are the focus areas and priorities for our regulators now to actually start shaping it before it becomes a big behemoth which can control as we see in the way the sphere has has now even become bigger than the governments and the influence of the government yeah so i think there are two perspectives one is how should this or, or what kind of regulation should come in and here actually the sad part is that nobody in the world has good answer so far so like i mean gdpr and then antitrust mechanism so play, europe is definitely showing the way but we know that even that is inadequate india definitely needs speed the data protection bill for example is still not through and even with the current bill there are many issues that have been pointed out right on governments for example having access to be being able to access data but at least that law is required because without that even i mean the the how do you really take action to fix and to control misuse so so regulation definitely needs to evolve but unfortunately nobody has the answers so so this is one of the other things right that the second part is that how do you fix this and right. this is again where i say that technologists have a strong role to play that because they are the one ultimately building these systems these are people like some of my closest friends for example nobody is sort of none of them are like bad people in the sense that they they want to control others exploit or anything but yet this they're building are causing grief
belief in some cases and there is this very wide tech clash i mean many of them have also i mean they talk about right the emotion that that issues that they go through because earlier when they would go to work it was all with a very positive mindset now they're sort of afraid of talking to other people and saying that i work in i work in that company because the narrative is that well the evil is not doing the right thing right like meta and others right, right? It's destroying the yeah. thing so it's causing them a lot of anguish that right how do we do it so i think that's the other place where i at least think that there is scope for a lot of change because technologists are realizing that they are in a path they can hold their and we've such cases happening with for example google now has a union the alphabet workers union correct and these unions are now their agenda is quite different from the blue collar kind of that we see otherwise the, the trade unions worker unions typically would talk about working conditions that we want more wages uh, safer working conditions all, all of that right. now what the alphabet workers union and similar initiative right similar collective action they are actually saying that well we want to say in what our labor is being used for we we want to be able to say that well we are spending our energy in building this product we want to be able to say what google should be able for and so this was one of these cases where face recognition and some technologies ultimately was wanting to sell this to the us military but then they did not so there are some successes also and so I, right so that's another mechanism i think can be the more people start thinking and exploring about these i think that is another way in which it can be more proactive as compared to regulation which typically ends up being reactive tech is evolving much faster than what the regulation can keep up yeah, yeah. actually I'll just a point one other point also which again i don't have a clear answer to this but right so if you look at technology in the medical space right. over there there are such strong review procedures right. Uh, right i mean you can't release a drug or like a medical device without right. it having gone it's through lives at risk sorry it's a lives at risk if it it's is lives not at risk. properly tested people yeah. could die exactly but i mean we never think of information technology in that way mm-hmm. i mean either one way is to say well maybe information technology is not that big a deal maybe health is is a much bigger deal that's one way to think about it but actually inter technology is causing a lot of issues and disruption and social distance yeah social distance even i mean even physically we've had right. cases even like deaths which have been attributed uh, failures of uh, biometric or authentication which have led to like starvation deaths things so so i mean that is also some it's no easy answer because the way it sort of gets shot down is that if you start treating information technology in a similar way then it will just kill innovation if it has to guidelines for each right. and every technology that you release so but yeah i mean i think these are questions we debated as tech gets more pervasive sector specific guidelines evolve i don't know but but i think these are all important things that i think we all have to learn and actively debate right adi i want to the regulatory discussion our indian context here our government has created such a tech based platform systems you have your aadhar you have your wax you have your financial system public health now obviously the government's intent and vision was actually great but somewhere down the line as the system grew their regulation or allowance allowance also grew as a result say for instance the aadhar card linked to several other systems like your banks income tax health benefits vaccines and etc had to be challenged in court and some of these decisions taken by different regulators or government department had to be challenged in the court and reverse now see in the us and many other countries other like initiatives have been there for ages and are working perfectly well so why this sort of an issue in regulating such public good uh, technologies and getting it challenged time and again in our court because our regulations are not great or we are not having a great model on the basis of which other has to operate yeah i mean i think with a lot with readiness of different mm-hmm. stakeholders right and many stakeholders there are many many stakeholders there are of course the users right beneficiaries right can they uh, right to what extent can they use if, if they're biometric is it for them to re-register fix some of that there are those issues then there are stakeholders like the government departments which which run many of these uh, or which use many of these services and are they following the right standard operating procedure that sort of have been laid down are they accountable are they uh, right if, if that if they're not following action taken then of course right the agencies which are driving the kind of the way these technology to talk to each other are they really listening to are they really understanding right cases where it's wrong have they thought about building adequate like diagnosis mechanism to figure out right i mean like this aadhar and bank linkage thing, such a uh, common thing which uh, right troubles so many people it happens right. because but there's no solution which sort of tells you that why is this thing broken is it because my name is spelled incorrectly is it because my aadhar number has been entered in- incorrectly is it because my mobile number is re- wrongly registered is it because some wrong aadhar number has been connected to the 
this bank account there's no diagnosis mechanism right it's like basically right probing a black box and then trying out different things and eventually right after like five six tries you might figure out okay this is how it is so i think there is so ef shoemaker kind back he coined this stuff, appropriate technology and he was talking about it from a, in a very different context it's like agricultural implements and which are manufactured using local material and they can be repaired locally and everything but at point all of that was that the technology is such that you can understand it people can if some they know fix it and that was i think core message and there were i mean other things like local for the environment and all of that as well but i think the core message for technology really was and sort of what we were talking from a digital literacy standpoint that if if the technology is moving so fast that people are not really able to grasp it then it becomes very difficult because if it's getting misused they wouldn't it will also be difficult for authorities to design the right policies or to regulate its usage so i think that's one of the issues even with systems like aadhar that yeah i mean all said and done great i mean you digitize and you eliminate intermediaries and all of that but actually what is led to is many of these can say corner cases but i don't use that term because and it gets dismissed as a case a corner case right focus on cases that it works and let's not worry about the corner case but these corner cases can be quite significant in terms of numbers and the problems right. that they can cause and and then it also requires that humility to accept that okay these things are going wrong and now let us see how to, how to fix it but this is the other part where one thing i embarrass about the i tech industry is that we always come as people who know all this. and even though actually we are very naive because we most of the time we've just been sitting in a lab working on a computer we have not even stepped out and actually met the users who are using our things and that's where i think this st- have this belief in you know just because we can write cool programs and run systems which are used by billions of users we think we're very powerful we're like god and just because we tell the computer what to do and it does what it what we ask it to do but actually the we miss out it sort of made us less humble we don't have that humility to accept that places where we're going wrong is actually because of the corner cases specifically that we missed and how do we so that humility is there so that we then start addressing it itself so see, the humility part is agar galti ho gaya if there is a mistake we can you know issue a patch right to correct right. and if right. there is a mistake in that patch like our booster vaccine will it issue a booster patch and <laughs> that's how you, the humility is not to accept the mistake yeah. it can always be corrected by a patch on a program right. and updated and what not so i right. guess that's the whole thing at mass market social technologies and systems i guess uh, need to evolve test like mentioned yeah. in our healthcare parlance as well where it has to be tested it has to be full proof before you actually go live or release right. instead of you know okay do patchwork 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 work like mm-hmm. many startups in, in our domain has gone in and then done right. before i want to conclude i have two more questions yeah. adi why is there nobel uh, laureate in the social development like the gramin from bangladesh from india um, yeah i mean <laughs> i i don't know i Are mean so foolish be. that don't understand a basic tech and we can't create a gramin like yeah yeah so i think that's where it is it is i think it's a great question you're asking kapil because i mean the point is that when we actually go on the ground we see so many so many such fabulous innovators and i mean right you no know, things like so i sort of lately become interested in the environment space and just recently right visited places where wastelands have been restored and it's like a lush really forest literally that's that's come up over there over the years and it required very good planning I, i've met some people who run these farmer cooperatives and it's amazing what they have accomplished but have basically they over the years they've been accumulating building a corpus and now they been able to corpus to set set up their own dal processing units and their own seed shop and i mean they're really challenging the market system uh, mm. by by sort of right building up their own strength and and is led to so much right so i mean the innovations are tremendous i think what is missing really is is being able to help scale those innovations and a lot of it comes down to capital a lot of it comes down to investors and i think the investors are chasing very like superficial numbers instead of actually investing in these kind of right we can call them ventures right investing mm. in these kind of ventures which, which are actually doing much much harder work and which may so these cooperatives might be, right they might be 30000 right instead of right everybody these days talks in terms of millions right nothing less than 10 20 million number of users makes sense to anybody these days but but why because because then the impact is also just that superficial but here you're actually deep very very deep impact the lives of those communities so i think those metrics judge impact those are important and if you start investing right if if such initiatives are scaled up i think there'll be tons and tons of nobel prizes for because the in the innovations the models that people have tried out 
are, are amazing. There's there's a lot out there. Last question, and this is a very topical one on moonlighting. Hmm. You see, there is a guy who has given so much to his lifetime earnings to a foundation, which is doing so much impact control. It's one of the largest foundations in the country. And his son says, you know what, people have to work for me. They can't moonlight. And then he earns that profit and the back foundation does on the ground. Such a circular uh, economy that he has created, his own company and his father's foundation. I want to know a techie in his free time work for a social venture and create some impact on the ground. What's his problem? Everything mm. has to be driven through his father's foundation. Mm. All the profits, all the work that he expects them to work for and not contribute single time or a money or or intellect of that techie social problem or a social sector isn't that very restrictive yeah yeah i mean it, it is i i guess i mean i'm sorry i happen to be an ex-employee of that company <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean i think it is it is in in the employees right also because i mean the contract that they sign with, with their employers right that also is about limited number of hours right, right. In, in which they're supposed to contribute so anything they do outside of that is sort of all the first free time so i don't think there is anything anything wrong in that i think it sort of i think these kind of cases should be should, should be talked about because the employee employer contract should be questioned I, I, right so i mean uh, before this we were talking about te- te- technologists being in a strong position that they can bargain right effectively with their employers and i think this is probably uh, some of these these mechanisms which can be strategically used to help uh, techies gain power right so be it about how how they use their free time that's that's one part but also sort of about what they want their to do actually not do because ultimately they, they it is their labor they, they and whatever intellectual property they're making right the contract says that okay now this intellectual property actually belongs to the employee and but it is being assigned as part of the contract to the employer now all of these things are i think up for debate that right what you do in your free time or under what rights should you assign the ip of your technology to your employer i think all of this should be questioned uh, so there was uh, one of the intelligent and ethic, Norbert Weiner, an MIT professor. So he wrote a book, Human Value of Human Beings. And part of that is also an open letter that wrote where some military people asked for access to some of his research. And he actually refused. He said that I don't trust, I don't trust that you will handle this research. And so he refused to give it to them. So this sort of, is, is, these are the kind of mechanisms employees can use. Because, you because know, because one, I mean, one the, basic uh, fundamental, I'm, I'm giving you my number of hours for which yeah. you are paying. Right. Now I have a certain interest intellect, I have a certain skill and if I want to do something for the society at large, create a program or a platform or whatever or maybe join Gramvani, the person in my free time and me happiness, why should this be considered a moonlighting that he is working and he should exclusively only work for, for me as an employee and not do anything else in his free yeah. time and should uh, you guys not go and challenge such you know, employers yeah, at absolutely. large? Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think. Great, Adi, it's pleasant pleasure talking to you and talking on a whole host of issues. There are so many more topics and issues I wanted to talk to you, but we have come at the end of our time. I really want to thank you for coming and talking to us, sharing your views on your book, firing book as well. And on behalf of our sponsors, and I really want to thank you for making it possible to come on our podcast and talk very candidly on technology and can it drive impact and happiness in society. No, thanks so much, KK, and thanks to all your team for having me. It was really a pleasure to you. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much and look forward to catching you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Bye. Take care. Bye.